Well, let's turn to the book of Joel here. Joel chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And we're on our series of the latter rain covenant, or the covenant that God made with Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church concerning the former and the latter rain. God made a covenant. In other words, there's conditions why the rain is held back and why God gives rain. Whether it's the Old Testament Israel with natural rain or the New Testament church with spiritual rain, there are reasons why it rains and reasons why it doesn't rain. Here this morning, I was going to preach the last message and give it the title, Backed Into a Corner. But I maybe want to change this title to Revival in Jerusalem. Revival in Jerusalem. Last week we dealt with the last revival or the last season of revival. It's going to come to the church in church history. And I said I was going to do a last message backed into a corner or how God is going to get himself this last revival or how he's going to get his people in a place in order to send this revival. So my theme is backed into a corner, but my title is Revival in Jerusalem because I believe this morning that's where the next revival, worldwide revival, is going to begin. And I'm going to prove it as I have done in other messages before Joel chapter 2 and verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, And sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after it even to the years of many generations. And notice this, it's talking about an army coming against Jerusalem. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array before their faces the people shall be much pained. All the faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb upon walls like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter into the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw the shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For he is the strong that executed his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Therefore also now saith the Lord. Or in other words, at this time, the Lord says to his people, Turn ye even to me with all of your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And he repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him. Even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow, set the trumpet in sand. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. 
sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet, let the priest, the minister of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land, and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied thereof, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, and I will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face towards the east sea, and his hinder parts towards the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savour shall come up, because he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Let's pray together. Ask for God to speak to us. Reveal something beautiful here this morning. Father, I pray here this morning that you birth a vision of an end day worldwide revival within our hearts built on biblical doctrine. Lord God, I do pray for an eschatological revival doctrine to be birthed within us, Lord God, and through us that we shall see and discern the hour that we live in. We don't want to be a hopeless and a helpless and a discouraged people who believe it's all over and it's all finished. And Lord God, there's nothing ever going to happen in our day. But my God, in the month of Listen, nor God, will you stir the hearts of your church again? Will you bring them back to Scripture to pray and to ask of you, send down the former and the latter rain in its season, even in the month Nissan? We are asking for a last revival. My God, rescue your church, rescue, oh God, the leaders, the preachers, rescue the young generation from their disco religion. My God, from their false Christianity, nor God, bring break and destroy the false prophetic movements that have arisen in our generation. And Lord God, let Christ, his blood, his cross, his atonement be central in the preaching one more time. Lord God, we ask it that your name will be glorified and sanctified in all the earth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. I said the theme of this will be backed into a corner. What do I mean backed into a corner? It's when your back is against the wall. There's no way out. There's nowhere for you to go. God has actually put you in a corner. There is no means of escape. And unless you have a fresh experience with God, you're finished. You're doomed. It's all over. Some of you need this in conversion. Where you get to a place of desperation. Where you say, if God doesn't meet with me, it's all finished. Some of you need it for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Where you say, I'm not leaving this room until God fills me with his Holy Spirit. There's some of you need miracles in your physical life. And you need to be backed into a corner. Where you say, either I'm going to die or I'm going to see a miracle from heaven again. Some of you sitting in this room need answers to prayer for your family, for your loved ones, for your own life. You need God to answer. Well, do you know what God will do? He'll put you in a corner. He'll back you into a place where there's no escape. Either you're going to die, turn your back on God, give up on everything, or you're going to see the miracle working God one more time. As we deal
deal with this message. I believe God has backed his real church into a corner in this last generation, in this 21st century, in this month of Nissan. As we read about, I actually believe that God has put his church in a corner. And unless we see a mighty revival again, it's all over. Over the preceding weeks, we have dealt with Joel chapter 2 and how he prophesied concerning the latter rain revival, how he was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Do you remember what we've dealt with over these three weeks or four weeks is the early rain, the winter rain, and the latter rain. What the natural rain is in Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, and the nation of Israel. So that is spiritually what God has done all through church history from the day of Pentecost until now. In other words, God took the rainy season in Israel as a prophetic type, a prophetic shadow with a prophetic message for 2,000 years of church history. First of all, Israel has the early rain or the autumn rain beginning in October to December. This is the rain where we plant the seed, we plow up the ground and the harvest begins. We know that that early rain finishes in December. It only has a period of time, then it finishes, and it finishes in December. When was the early rain in the church? It began on the day of Pentecost, and for at least 300 years, the early rain of revival, outpourings of the Holy Spirit were sent to the church came through the church and increasingly spread out into all of the world. For three or four centuries, there were continual outpourings, but they came to an end. Then we come to the winter rain. Israel in December through to March has winter rain in the darkest period of its, of its annual history. We, the church, had our winter rain or our winter period during 1,000 years of history, from Constantine through until the Reformation in about 1517, there were a thousand years where God sent that winter rain in the darkness of night. And then last of all, we have the latter rain, which begins in March through to April, and it finishes at the end of April. When did the latter rain come to the church? It began with the Reformation. It came all through the Methodist revival. It spread out all over the world in the 1904 revival in Wales, in the Great Awakening in America, and many other revivals through until 1906 with the Pentecostal revival, when God poured out His Spirit all over the globe. And for almost a century, there has been a remarkable gathering of souls through the latter rain revival. But saints, as I said before, I believe the latter rain revival has come to an end or it's just about to dramatically end. I believe we've been born for such a day and now God has backed us into a corner. The day of revival is gone. The day of great outpourings is gone. The day when God shakes cities and nations, it is gone. We are about to enter a terrible wilderness period and we already have in the, in the Western world. Unless another revival comes, it's all over. The evangelism is over. The missionary enterprises is over. Great and gatherings of souls are over. The great works of God are over. But I want to tell you here this morning that I believe that Joel prophesies one last unusual short period of revival and he calls it the former and the latter rain revival notice with me in Joel chapter 2 and verse 23 it says he will cause to come down for you the rain the former rain and the latter rain in the first month in other words the month of May or the month Nisan the Bible actually says that God is going to send a supernatural, unique revival in the last, or sorry, the first month, the month of Nisan. In Jerusalem and in Israel, only about one day of rain falls in the month of May 
in the city of Jerusalem. In other words, the rain comes to an end. It's almost unusual even to have one day of rain in the month of May in the city of Jerusalem. God has brought the rain to an end. The latter rain has finished. The revivals of history are all over. But saints, Joel prophesies one very unusual thing. He says in that month of May, when there should be no rain at all, Joel prophesies several hundred years before Christ that I am going to send one last unique period of revival. And he says, I'm not just going to send the latter rain. And I'm not just going to send the former rain. What I'm going to do is send the former rain and the latter rain all in the month of May, all together. This is unheard of in Israeli history or in their uh, uh, economy or in their normal seasons. This is a supernatural work of God where God is going to take all the revivals of the early century, beginning on the day of Pentecost all the way through for 300 years. And he's going to take all the revivals from the Reformation right down to the 20th century. And he's going to join them together. And in one short period of time, God is going to send us the Welsh revival again. And he's going to send us the Methodist revival. And he's going to send us the Pentecostal revival. And he's going to send us the Jerusalem revival. And the Sumerian revival. And the Caesarean revival. And he's going to, as he poured out in the early centuries, he's going to send it again. Saints, it seems like it's all over. We've come to the month of May. It seems like all we have is five months of intolerable heat without any rain. But I want to assure you, God has prophesied one last hour of revival in the month of Nisan. If you study the month of Nisan in the Bible, it is very fascinating. Do you realize it was in the month Nisan that Israel were delivered from Egypt as we heard round the Lord's table. Through the blood, an entire nation is delivered from 400 years of captivity. When did it happen? In the month Nisan. We also read about Ezra and Nehemiah returning to the city of Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the house of God. When did Ezra come back to Jerusalem? Or when was he given permission? The month Nisan. When was Nehemiah there in the very house of King Artaxerxes and bringing him his cup in great sadness? You know why? For four months he'd been weeping, broken over the condition of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the gates have been burnt out. The walls are broken down. God's house is desolate. Jerusalem is finished. And for four months, Nehemiah is praying. He is weeping. He is, has a broken heart. But in the month Nisan, as he stands before the great Persian king, the king looks at him and says, Nehemiah, why are you sad? And we know he quickly prayed, oh God, help me. And he said, oh king, it's because of the condition of Jerusalem. And we know the king said, I'm going to help you get back there and restore it again. Or what about the days of Esther? Since I'm telling you what happens in Nisan. What about the days of Esther? You remember in her days in the Persian Empire that Haman had concocted a plot to destroy the entire people. Do you know when he began his plan? The month Nisan. It was the month Nisan that he put his plan into operation and said, I'm going to destroy Israel. I am going to annihilate every single Jew. But saints, it was also the month Nisan that Esther rose up and saved her people from annihilation. You see, it was also the month Nisan that Christ was crucified, but also the month Nisan that Christ rose triumphant from the grave and ascended to the right hand of the Father. You see, the month Nisan in the Bible is the month of liberation. But can I also say that the month Nisan is also a tragic crisis hour when God's people have their back against the wall. 
They're put in a corner. It seems like everything is over. It seems like the enemy has won. That that nothing is going to happen. That it's the end of God's purpose in the earth. But it's it's the month Nisan also that God comes through to deliver his people. You see, the month Nisan is harvest month. It is the month where the ripened barley and the barley harvest comes to fullness, to fruition. And it gets brought into the house of God in a way that it never has in any other season. Jesus always talked about the very end of the age or the end of church history as harvest time. In his parables, he talks about the harvest time when he shall return again for his church but he calls it harvest time or the time when everything gets brought in or comes to fulfillness. That is the end of the age. Harvest time comes at the end, not a century before the end. It comes right at the end in the last generation, in the month Nissan before Jesus comes back. Here this morning, let me preach to you about being backed into a corner and about the last revival. Look with me for a moment at Joel's day. What was happening (coughs) in Joel's day when he prophesied? It says in Joel chapter 2 verse 25, and I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Do you remember what I said last year about when Joel stood up and began to preach and prophesy? The nation had almost been totally destroyed. If you read Joel chapter 1, you see that Israel and Jerusalem was under a plague, was under a plague of locusts and of caterpillars and palmer worms and canker worms that had destroyed all the harvest all the trees, all the plants, and all the seeds in the land. The entire nation was in a drought. All the rivers had dried up. The nation was actually afflicted by famine. Fires were burning everywhere. The house of God was almost ready to close. There's no sacrifice to bring in. Nobody has joy anymore. They know about God. They know the Bible, but there's no joy in the land. It seems like God has deserted them. There's no revival. There's no rain. There's no former rain or winter rain or latter rain. There's no revival in God's house. There's no spiritual growth. Everything they do seems to come to nothing. Notice with me, this great army of locusts had destroyed and eaten everything in the nation. In chapter 1 and 6, it actually speaks about this army of locusts. And it calls them a nation that has come upon the land strong without number, whose teeth are as the teeth of a lion. He describes these locusts as a vicious animal. They have come as a great nation, as a great army. And they have destroyed the entire nation. Do you know what was happening in Joel's day? The entire nation, the priests, the prophets, the farmers, the women, the mothers, the daughters are all backed into a corner. You are in serious trouble. Anyone looking at God's people would think it is over. They would say this is the devil. Or that man himself alone is responsible for this. Or they would blame the locusts as the enemies of God. But God actually said, this locust army is my army. I sent them into the land and it afflicted the land for years. But he also gives a promise and a prophecy. He says, I will restore. If you listen to me in your personal life, in your church or your nation, I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. Everything the enemy has done for years, everything that's been eaten, stolen from you, everything that's been destroyed in the church, everything that has disappeared from our generation. The Bible says, I will restore it unto you. In other words, I will give it to you. I'm going to take it and give it all back to you. Everything that you have lost for many years, I'm going to suddenly give it back to you. You know what? 
when, when I send down the rain, when I pour out my Holy Spirit, do you realize when the Holy Spirit comes down in this church, we'll get all the backsliders back. We'll get all those who heard the gospel run into the church door. We will see those that have lost the joy of the Lord, getting the joy of the Lord back again. You see, in Joel's day, God's people have been backed into a corner. But here stands up a prophet and he said, it's not over. Listen to me, nation. Blow the trumpet in this hour. It isn't finished. If you actually come back to repentance, to prayer, to fasting, this is the pathway back to mighty outpourings of the Holy Spirit. There is a day of visitation. In Joel's day, in chapter 1, this is called the day of the Lord. Listen to me for a moment. This is important what I'm saying this morning. I'm preaching to you this morning. This is called the day of the Lord. In Joel's prophecy, there's three days of the Lord talked about. There's Joel's day was the day of the Lord. Then in chapter 2, there's another day of the Lord, which is still in our future. And third of all, in chapter 3, there's a day of the Lord when Jesus comes back again for his people. There are three days of the Lord mentioned in the book of Joel. And this term is mentioned five times in this prophecy. What is the day of the Lord? It's a unique period in history when God's judgments and his blessings are revealed very powerfully amongst his people. Listen to me, both come together where God in a very unusual way, he pours his judgments out uh, in the midst of the nations. He comes and he reveals himself in terrible judgment. But at the very same time, God is saying, with that judgment, I want to pour out Utterly unique revivals. I want to send you a revival that you've never seen in your entire generation. You see, I believe that God was preparing Joel and the people. Their back was against the wall. They had lost everything. But the way back to real Pentecost is repentance, fasting, and prayer. If you come this way, you'll get the early rain again. You'll get the winter rain again. You'll get the latter showers again. If, if you become worldly and carnal and sinful and begin to disobey the word of God, you will lose the rain of revival. That's why we've lost it in this generation. What happened in Peter's day? When Joel's prophecy came to pass, 120 believers are in an upper room in Jerusalem. Listen this. They pray and they tarry for 10 days. They're in the same place praying for 10 days. I believe they read Joel's prophecy. I believe they were repenting. They were praying. They were fasting. They were seeking God. And we're told that for 10 days, they united in prayer, in unity of heart together, only 120. And suddenly on the day of Pentecost, the wind began to blow through the room. Tongues of fire descended on each of their heads. The Holy Spirit was outpoured. Each one of them was filled to overflowing. And that 120 poured out of the upper room into the streets of Jerusalem. And they began to praise God and worship God in at least 15 international languages. Saints, this is real revival. It has happened and it can happen again, I assure you. Our God has not changed. What was the result? The crowd was shocked and astounded. Thousands of people stood in awe saying, what is this? And Peter stood up and began to preach and said, you have crucified the Lord, our Messiah, even Jesus. You caused his death. It was confrontational, repentance preaching. And we're told that 3,000 People were born again. On the day of Pentecost, these revivals began. They have continued for 2,000 years of church history. But they have come to an end. Saints, we are now in the hour of Nissan. We saw Joel's day, Peter's day. But let, you, let me bring you now to our day. Our own day. You see, Joel 1 talks about the day of the Lord. He spoke to his own people and said, look what has happened. The locusts have destroyed everything, the entire harvest. 
And there's an army at our northern border about to invade us. And if we pray, if we fast, God will deliver us from that northern army that's going to come down and take Israel. That's chapter 1. When we come to Joel chapter 2, we have a different season which he's prophesying about. It didn't happen in Acts chapter 2. It didn't happen in Joel's day. It's actually for the future and our own generation. In Joel chapter 2, it says the day of the Lord is at hand. In other words, his judgment is at the door. We realize that God's judgments are just about to fall in Joel chapter 2. But notice with me, the first 11 verses of Joel 2 is all about a mighty northern army invading Israel and attacking Jerusalem. Notice in verse 2, they're called a great people. In verse 11, it's called his army. In verse 17, they're called the heathen who desire to rule over Israel. In verse 20, they're called the northern army. You see, the Bible says the Lord sends this northern army against Jerusalem and against Israel. I am telling you what's just about to happen in our generation in fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And I'm telling you, listen to me closely. I am about to tell you when Nissan, the Nissan revival is going to start. I'm about to tell you where it's going to start and how it's going to start. I'm about to show you from the Bible when the next season of revival is going to start and impact all of us worldwide. Because I believe the the Bible reveals it here in Joel chapter 2. It actually shows us of a time of a great massive army. In Joel's day, it was an army of locusts. But now in our day, or in the days to come, when Israel is back in their nation, the prophet says a great army is going to amass on the northern border of Israel, present day Israel in our generation. Do you know what? God is going to back Israel into a corner. You know why? He wants to send a last revival. God wants to come in great power again. But do you know what he's going to do? He is about to, and I'm going to show you this and prove it. God is about to in world politics and in the military Middle East, he's about to put Israel with its back against the wall. And a great army like Joel prophesied about in Joel 2 is going to come to the border of it. It's an army unstoppable. It's an army impregnable. Nobody can stop this army. No other army can contend with them. And they actually come against Israel to her northern border. What am I talking about? I'm actually talking about something that's about to happen. But notice in Joel 2, God destroys this northern army in in verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land, and he will pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied thereof. And I will no more make your approach among the heathen. Do you see what he's going to do? As this army is on the northern border of Israel, about to come in and take the entire nation. God here says, I'm going to stir with jealousy. I'm going to arise with power and I'm going to save you and bring spiritual conditions back to you one more time. He says in verse 19, yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, behold, I will send you corn, etc. Verse 20, and I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into the land barren and desolate. Do you know where this area is, he begins to explain, is the western bank of Israel, where the Palestinians dwell at the minute, and they want their own homeland and their own state. This is where it's talking about. A great northern army is going to come to the northern border of Israel. And as they invade Israel through the west bank or through the land of the Palestinians, God here says, I am going to drive him back into a barren, desolate land with his face towards the east 
sea, which is the Dead Sea, and his backside towards the Mediterranean. In other words, as they're about to invade Israel, God is going to turn them back and destroy them on the West Bank. This great northern army. Does the Bible anywhere else speak about this northern evasion of Jerusalem? Yes. In Ezekiel chapter 36 to 39. In Ezekiel chapter 36 to 39, we read about the present day history of Israel. How that in the last days, God is going to regather Israel, birth her as a nation again, and put Jews from all over the world back in the land of Israel. Do you realize there's 6 million Jews back in Israel? And that's all happened since 1948. Ezekiel prophesies the regathering, the restoration, the resurrection, and then finally, the spiritual revival of Jerusalem and of the nation of Israel again. Have they been birthed as a nation already? Yes. Are they back in the nation? Yes. Have they put their military together and their economics together and their science together? They are a remarkable nation in the world, the little nation of Israel. But you know what has never happened in recent history? They have not had a revival as yet or a spiritual revival. When is revival going to come to Jerusalem? We're told in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, it talks about a great northern army coming to invade Israel in the last days after she's been regathered from all nations, after she is back in her land, after the nation blossoms again. Ezekiel 38 begins to tell us that a great army, a northern army, is going to come against her. Three times in these two chapters, we are told about this army coming from the north, from the north quarters, from thy place in the north parts, or to come from the north parts. Three times it's mentioned. The Hebrew means from the uttermost furthest point are bounds of the north. In other words, this army is going to come from the extreme north and come down and invade the nation of Israel. What is this northern nation? What is this people of the north? Who are they? Do you know in Jeremiah 16, 23, it talks about Israel being regathered from the land of the north. Today in Israel, one million of the six million Jews that are back in Israel, were born in Russia. Do you realize today that 20% of those living in Israel speak Russian as their first language, as their national language? In other words, one out of every five or six Jews in Israel was birthed in Russia, but has moved. You see, the Bible's true that I'm going to regather from the northern land. The land of the north is Russia. And here we have in Ezekiel, the Bible also says a great army is going to come from the north to invade Israel after the regathered from all nations. It's never happened yet. It has never happened since 1948. Exactly what I'm about to tell you. Do you realize in Ezekiel's prophecy, it gives us the name of the countries who are going to join together as this northern army to invade the land of Israel? Listen to me. It gives the name of the countries as Russia, Turkey, Iran, Sudan, Libya, and Armenia. And it says this great northern army, as it invades, that five out of six of the soldiers die and are killed on the West Bank or in the land of the Palestinians. It's very exact. It tells us where it happens. So we see in Joel 2, it tells us where this northern army is going to die. Here in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it says where the army, the northern army is going to die. It's exactly the same place. The mountains of Israel, this large aggressive army is going to be destroyed. 
Do you realize it's an Islamic army? And this is going to mean the fall of Islam in our generation. And it's going to open wide the door for us to evangelize the Arabic Muslim nations of the world. I assure you, on that day, we'll evangelize the Muslim on our street. And we'll say the God of the Bible is the God of salvation. You must be born again. You ought to ask any of the Muslims on the street, why is it the God of our Bible has defeated the God of Allah every time they invade Israel? Every time a Muslim army comes against Israel, small Israel, your large army is always defeated. Can you please explain that to me? No Muslim will have an answer. Allah has been defeated already, but he's God is getting ready to defeat Allah in a way that is utterly remarkable in church history. Listen to what I just said. I said the first three countries in this northern invasion are Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Do you realize these three countries did not get on until two years ago in 2016? It was only in the summer of 2016, two years ago that Russia, Turkey, and Iran began to come together and create an alliance, a military alliance, a political alliance. You see, in 2016, when I saw this happen, I said, the time is drawn near for Ezekiel's war when Russia, with an Arab Muslim army, is about to invade Israel. Saints, I'm so excited because of what's going to happen. God is going to put Israel in a corner. America isn't going to save them. Britain isn't going to save them. Europe isn't going to save them. Saudi Arabia won't save them. God is going to come and rescue them. Do you realize that all through this year of ours, 2018, that Sudan and Libya, who are mentioned in this list as well, I, I've looked at the newspapers all throughout this year. Now Sudan and Libya said, we want in on this alliance with Russia, Turkey, and Iran. We want to be closer joined to you militarily, economically, politically. We want to be joined together. Do you know what this tells me? Is that God is preparing to send this northern army against Jerusalem and Israel. Do you realize the Bible prophesies this? But St. you'll say, what's this got to do with revival? It's got everything to do with revival. At the end of teaching about Ezekiel's war, when God defeats these enemies, listen to the very last verse in Ezekiel 39, 29. God begins to speak and he says, when I destroy this army, all nations are going to know I'm the God of the Bible. They are going to know that the God who wrote scriptures of the holy prophets is true. I'm going to reveal myself in the day of the Lord. I'm going to reveal myself in terrible judgments of judging my enemies. Do you know Russia persecuted Christians for generations and God has yet to judge that nation. He's going to do it on the mountains of Israel. I'm telling you what's about to happen. You're going to see it on your news. I believe this. But the very last verse of it, it says, Neither will I hide my face anymore from them, Israel. Until this Ezekiel's war, the Bible says God has hid his face from Israel. In other words, they don't know him as God. They've rejected Jesus as Messiah. But listen, but no more is that going to happen. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Do you realize at the end of Ezekiel's war, God pours out his Holy Spirit on Jerusalem and he pours out his spirit on the land of Judea. Do you realize God at the end of that, they're all going to say, surely the God of the Bible is true. And then in Joel chapter two, when God destroys the northern army, do you know what he's going to do? He's going to pour out the early and the latter rain in its season in the month Nisan. The Bible is actually indicating to us when the next season of revival begins. This short time of revival is coming. You say, I, I need more evidence. I don't believe you. Okay, I'll give you more evidence. Roman chapter 11, New Testament, taught by the Apostle Paul. He's speaking about the nation of Israel in the last days and the, na and the Gentile nations of the world. Listen to what he says in verse 12. 
nor of the fall of Israel be the riches of the world. What's he saying? When Israel fell and rejected Jesus 2,000 years ago, when they rejected the former reign, when they rejected the blood, when they rejected the apostles, do you know what happened? The gospel went to the Gentile nations and has done for 2,000 years. The Bible actually says when Israel fell, it meant that the riches of the gospel went to all the nations of the world. That Pentecost, outpourings of the Spirit, were sent all around the world. In other words, from the day of Pentecost, which started in Jerusalem, it has gone all around the world. It visited Korea. It went to China. It's been in Japan. It's been in America. It's even been in Ireland. There has been outpourings of the Spirit for 2,000 years. But Israel rejected this revival. It says the diminishing of them or the deterioration of Israel has been the riches of the Gentiles. Isn't it true? They rejected this revival. We the Gentiles receive it. Uh, uh, Patrick came to Ireland. There was revival in Ireland under Patrick's preaching. Israel rejected it. But Ireland got the gospel and it changed the entire nation. Since their fall brought, brought the blessing of the gospel to all the world. But listen to what, he, what Paul writes. How much more their fullness. In other words, Israel being cut off, rejected. Look what it's done in our world. But then the apostle says, what about their fullness? What about when Israel is brought back in again? What about when he takes that natural branch and he brings it back in and he grafts it back into the tree of the body of Christ one more time. What is the effect going to be? If this happened with their fall, what's going to happen with their fullness? Do you realize the fullness of Israel has not come yet? It is yet to happen. This is yet to be fulfilled. Then in verse 15 in Romans 11, it says, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? What shall the receiving of them be? But life from the dead. In other words, if this happened when Israel and Jerusalem rejected and got cut off, what's going to happen when this Nissan revival begins in Jerusalem again? When this revival returns to the land of its beginnings again, what's going to happen when God pours out His Spirit after Ezekiel's war? You know what it said? It's going to be the beginning of a worldwide revival again. I believe this is the last worldwide revival in church history. Since I am telling you what the Bible actually teaches, that if Israel being cast in a way, look what it done to our nations. When they experience turning to the Lord again. And it says in Romans 11, all Israel shall be saved. Most of them, the majority of them, in a sudden massive conversion of the Jewish, atheistic, immoral population. It's going to be that Israel has become Christian again. Do you know the effect on the world that's going to have? The Bible actually says, for the Gentiles... For the nations of the world, when this happens to Israel, it's going to be like life from the dead. Do you see what happened so far in 2,000 years? You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm just giving you the scripture. When Israel comes back in again, it's going to be the beginning of one of the most remarkable periods in church history. Saints, let me finish with one other por portion. So that you're assured that the Bible teaches us. In Zechariah chapter 12 and 13, it also speaks about an invading army coming against Israel. It's not the last invasion of Zechariah 14. It's a different one. In Zechariah 12, it says the nations come up against Jerusalem. That's what happens in verse 9. Listen to what happens in verse 10. You have the nations coming against Jerusalem. It's an end day prophecy that's in the last generation. In verse 10, it says, I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. What inhabitants? The inhabitants of Jerusalem. The spirit of grace and of supplication. 
Verse 10 says they'll look upon him who they have pierced. And they're going to begin to mourn in bitterness over their sin. That for 2,000 years they've rejected Jesus Christ. They're going to look with faith upon the one they pierced. Do you realize this revival that begins in Jerusalem is going to be a Christ-centered revival? A revival of real repentance. It then says in verse 11, In that day there shall be opened a fount in the house of David. Remember how we sing? There is a fount filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. Do you know in Jerusalem, in the days just ahead, after Ezekiel's war, after Russia falls and the Muslim nations fall, in God's judgment, that God is going to show himself merciful. You know why? There's going to be a people on the streets of Jerusalem and in churches in Israel. And you know what they're going to start doing when they see that northern army? They're going to read the book of Joel and they see this great northern army and they're going to begin to repent and to pray and to fast and to say, send us the former and the latter rain. Send us an outpouring of the Spirit. As they see that northern army, they're going to say, oh God, deliver us from the northern army. Send a revival. Bible. It says here in Zechariah 12 that God's going to open up a fount in the house of David for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Those living in Jerusalem, there's going to be the blood is going to be revealed for their cleansing, their forgiveness. In verse 12, it says, I'm going to cut off all the names of idols from the land, all idolatry, false gods, false religions, and bringing holiness back to Israel. I'm going to bring them back to a belief in the real God. And last of all, in this revival, in chapter 13, it actually begins to say, and I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. What's it saying? Israel today is filled with false prophets. Do you know all these false revivals and false movements and false Bible teachers? They all go to Jerusalem. If you turn on uh, the God channel, they've all, they're all standing on the walls of Jerusalem and they're teaching their heresies from Jerusalem itself. The Bible says when this revival begins, this former and latter revival, the revival of Nisan, the God is going to clean out the false prophets. Those false prophets who have deceived the church, who have lied, who put special garments on and said, look, I'm a prophet. Those who were under the influence of unclean spirits, lying spirits, deceiving spirits. The Bible says he's going to sweep away this false revival. What is the false revival? It's all around us at the minute. They are dominionist, kingdom now, the new order of the latter reign. Manifest sons of God, the new apostolic reformation movement are sometimes called Joel's army. They believe they're the locus of Joel's too. Do you know all these false revivals? Toronto through to Florida. They say they're Joel's army. We're the locus. We are gonna, we are gonna come down like that mighty army. That's what they say about themselves. Do you know what? They are absolutely correct. But we're told in Zechariah. This false revival that's come into the church and that targets the city of Jerusalem. When this Christ-centered revival begins, God says their mummies and daddies are going to stab them with the word of God and say, Stop prophesying, son. Go out and get a job. Get rid of that prophet's mantle that you've been wearing. Stop telling your lies. Stop deceiving the crowds. Stop playing religion. We have come back to a holy revival one more time. Joel prophesied, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. God is going to pour out his spirit one last time. Since we are in a dry, barren day, the rain, the latter rain has stopped. But I want to encourage you here this morning. The last missionary revival has not happened yet. The last outpouring of the Spirit has not happened. The last movement of genuine miracles has not happened. True repentance and holiness and righteousness is going to be restored unto the church. One last time. Then saints, we're out of here. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Christ is going to come to reign over the nations. 
But I believe this is his calendar of revival. When God, one last time, before he comes for the harvest, is going to pour out his Holy Spirit upon you and I. Why don't we, as a church, one last time, go back to Pentecost? Not a denomination, but a biblical teaching of a genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Saints, this will restore the joy to your life. This will bring fruit to this church. This will put everything back that the canker worm has stolen from us over these five years. Let's stand together. Oh, thank you, Lord.